everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome back to the Institute for Science and Policies, day two of our symposium, Living with Uncertainty. Hopefully you had a chance to join us yesterday uh, for all of our great programming. I know I saw many of you last night at our reception as well. Uh, we have recordings available for all of yesterday's programming and the talk that we did last night. We hopefully will get that up on our YouTube channel either later today um, or sometime this week and we'll send that link out. Um, I'm really excited for today's talk. Hopefully you had a chance to join us yesterday. Uh, all Hold of on. Our programming. I know I saw many of you last night at our reception as well. Uh, we have recordings. There we go. So I was getting some feedback. I think other people were as well. So um, pause there just for a minute. Uh, okay, where are we expecting for today? I'm really excited. We are gonna have about an hour conversation here with three amazing experts that are based here in Colorado. Not only are they great researchers and scientists, they are great communicators. And we're gonna talk about communicating scientific uncertainty. Um, after our panel presentation today, uh, many of you have signed up for workshops uh, focusing on either climate change or public health. Um, and maybe a little bit of those who are interested in the intersection of the two, uh, but those were kind of our two big themes. We have three of our folks here will help lead those conversations. Uh, it will be very interactive, very hands-on. We encourage you in those breakout sessions to turn on your camera and mic. We'll be there to support you and tell you what to do when we're done with today's talk on how to get in there. Um, there we go. We got some. We got the audio working on our side. Uh, so let me introduce our three guests that we have joining us this morning. Uh, we have Max Boykoff. Uh, Max is a professor in the Environmental Studies program and serves as chair for that. He's also a fellow for a series up at CU Boulder, which is the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences, for those of you who are not familiar with the acronym. Um, he's a contributing author to the IPCC 6 assessment. Uh, he also leads our AAAS Local Science Engagement Network uh, group that's been here for a couple years. And the Institute greatly gets to appreciate to partner with Max and that group uh, whenever there's a great opportunity to do that. Uh, he's got a long list of accomplishments. He's got a great book, actually, it's probably over here. If you all haven't seen one of his many books, this is Creative Climate Communications. Um, obviously, it's on my desk for a reason. Uh, good morning, Max. Thanks for being here today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks, Kristen. Nice to be with all three of you. Great. Thank you. We also have Chris Karnaskas joining us. Chris also is at CU Boulder. Uh, he is in the uh, associate professor for the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences. He's also a fellow at Ceres. Um, and he has faculty appointments with CU School of Medicine and the Carl School of Public Health. You heard me alluding to a little bit of the intersection of climate and public health, and Chris has been doing a lot of work in that area. He's an author at the American Geophysical Union's Geophysical Research Letters, as well as serving as a section editor for PLOS Climate. Um, I got to know Chris here for many years. We had the pleasure of working together for, I don't know how many years, on the U.S. CLIVAR program, the Climate Variability and Predictability Program. Uh, Chris, it's good to see you again. How are you this morning? Good morning, Kristen. Thank you very much. Very great to be here. Thanks. Great. Lovely to see you. Um, and our third person joining us this morning is Dr. Nicole Kelp. Uh, she is an assistant professor at Colorado State University and the Colorado School of Public Health. I think she has a few affiliations, actually. Uh, she has a deep passion for science education and communication, as well as curriculum development. Um, she is up at CSU right now and is working on developing medical science curriculum for their new branch at the Colorado School of Medicine up there in Fort Collins. Uh, she serves as chair of the medical science content directors for the school, and she does a lot of research on thinking about scientific uncertainty communication during emerging public health crises, such as infectious diseases, including probably our most recent pandemic. Good morning, Nicole. How are you? I am good. Thank you for having me here. Awesome. So we're going to have a little bit of a stage setting presentation. Nicole's going to give that for us for here in about 10 minutes just to kind of set the landscape. And then we're going to move into a conversation between the three of them. Um, I'll help bring in any questions that you all have into that conversation. So feel free to drop your questions in the comments when we get there. Um, and we'll have a good conversation um, where we can just kind of dig a little bit deeper into both case studies and tools and tips about communicating scientific uncertainty. Uh, so let me turn this over to Nicole. And Nicole, why don't you give us a little bit of uh, some groundwork to start our conversation today. 
Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to quickly show my screen here. And there we go. Um, so like Kristen said, we're going to be talking about scientific uncertainty specifically with how we communicate about it um, and its specific applications for climate change and public health. And many of you, if you were in the presentations yesterday, we thought a lot about how we think about uncertainty. Um, but then how do we talk about that with diverse audiences as a result? Um, so there's a, several types of uncertainty and some of these terms were maybe mentioned yesterday but that's really important for us to think about in terms of communication when we say oh this situation is uncertain what does that mean to different audiences what does that mean to us as scientists or other audiences and really specifying that can be helpful for being on the same page and having a productive conversation um and i I think it's really important to help differentiate when we think about uncertainty between risk and uncertainty because with risk we know a probability or outcome outcome there's a 50 percent risk of whatever but with uncertainty we don't know and this really came to a head during covid and so this is a quote from um, the dean of the colorado school of public health john Samet, in a news article early in february 2021 so if you all recall the, the vaccines were just coming out and starting to be available we were still in the thick of things um and what dr Samet said is that uncertainty about the magnitude of risk often clouds decision making. And so when I don't know if I have a 20% risk of contracting COVID or an 80% risk, I don't know what decisions to make. Additionally, judgments of acceptability as to level of risk vary among people. And so even if we knew there was a 50% risk you were gonna contract COVID, that risk might be a risk that one person is willing to take and another person isn't. And so thinking about decision making with public health or climate change, um, is complicated by all these factors. Not only do people have different um, levels of ac acceptability for these risks, but also we don't always know what the risks are because of the uncertainty and the different types there. And there's just a lot of different types of uncertainty and clarifying what we're dealing with is really useful. So sometimes we can have qualitative uncertainty. There's just doubt. We can't, some of these words, epistemology or ontology, is basically how we do science. What kind of data or things can we know or not know? Um, how does that affect society? But then we also have really quantitative uncertainty. We have confidence intervals or other ways we measure, um, and we aren't sure um, with climate change exactly what degrees of um, warming we might have, and those can be really quantified types of uncertainty. And sometimes we have situations where we have both the qualitative and quantitative. Um, and other authors have split this into, this is kind of two different qualitative and quantitative levels of uncertainty. Um, other authors have classified kind of four levels of uncertainty. And so the first two here, epistemic and technical, that's kind of that qualitative and quantitative um, that I previously mentioned. But I think when we talk about communicating scientific uncertainty, these other two, consensus and just kind of general scientific uncertainty, are really critical. So consensus uncertainty, when we have divergent views among experts, this can really be complicated for people to accept and recognize and understand why if we have this data or these numbers is there not consensus and so when we're talking with audiences and there might be confusion or hesitancy to understand and trust what's going on in the scientific process remembering that they might have heard communication about an uncertain situation in different ways from different even reputable experts and the way they interpret that data and so keeping that in mind can help us develop a better conversation and not jump to conclusions about people's beliefs or interaction with the science, recognizing that different sources, people can interpret that differently. And so that consensus uncertainty, I think, is a critical piece in engaging in good conversations. And then just remembering that science is inherent, inherently uncertain and we're never going to 100% get to certainty. Um, and that there is an evolving nature to the scientific process. Um, and that's honestly a good thing. And so like we heard yesterday in the keynote, the kind of good possibilities that can arise with uncertainty. Um, and so keeping in mind these different kinds of uncertainty, um, and I know throughout the panel, we probably will talk about different ways we think about uncertainty, how that impacts our work. Um, but 
remembering that the complicatedness, which is kind of another level, is can make this difficult for audiences. And so we as scientists, we're over here with all of our different uncertainty frames and how we're dividing this. Um, and you can have these probabilities and, oh, I'm not sure what the probability is, but remembering for anyone, uh, uh, someone trying to make a public health decision, do, do I mask, do I vaccinate? This framing here is about a patient trying to make a health decision in terms of what treatments to take for breast cancer, someone trying to decide um, how they're interacting with the environment and climate change. This is really complex. And so when we think about communicating scientific uncertainty, remembering the to have empathy for the audiences we're talking with, um, because this is really complex, even for scientists, but also for those who maybe aren't as familiar with the scientific process. Um, and we could quantify kind of how uncertain things are. Do, do we know which future is more likely or we aren't sure what future is more likely? Is it completely unknown? And when it's completely unknown, that can be really difficult for people to understand. Um, we heard about the, kind of the psychological response to uncertainty a little bit yesterday. Uncertainty causes something called ambiguity aversion. So all like ambiguity have an aversion to that. And different people have different levels of tolerance for that. But we, we all want to have a more certain future. And so trying to navigate and cope and tolerate with this is going to be something that we'll talk about kind of with some tools for communication. How do we help people work in this spaces? Um, and we can help people order or classify the uncertainty. Those different types of uncertainty I talked about, oh, this is from a measurement versus this, we, we know what the measurement is, but the way we interpret that and the consensus on that is here. Or there's just actually no way to know that or measure that with our current scientific tools. Talking through that can be really useful to help someone that you're discussing with understand where the uncertainty is coming from. Um, we can adjust the uncertainty and some of us um, ignore the uncertainty. Some of us might want to highlight the ignorance. And so we can go to those extremes um, and we'll talk a little bit more in the panel about how as humans, we, we don't like this uncertainty, right? We often want to kind of fill in the story and that can lead to, for example, the development of misinformation. If I have part A through B of a story and my brain comes up with part C to try to fill it in, if C is incorrect, that can lead to misinformation. How can we help audiences handle and cope and complete the story without jumping to in uncorrect conclusions. But ultimately, we need to remember to have a lot of humility, um, remembering that this is complicated for audiences and for ourselves as humans to deal with. Flexibility, the way I communicate to one person is not necessarily the best way to communicate to another person. And then just have a lot of courage to try new things in our communication and work with different audiences in different ways. Um, and so we'll kind of talk about this in our own experience. And I'm really looking forward to hearing kind of from Max and Chris about their experience with how they handle these complicated conversations. There's no one best way to communicate scientific uncertainty. Different audiences have different needs. And we need to really have that empathy to remember that it's, it is complicated for people and uncomfortable for people. Um, and having that empathy can help us really engage and connect with them better. Um, so how can we give better number ranges or use positive versus negative language. All of those things can be part of those tools to have that empathetic mindset, but really starting the stage with some of those, that empathy and understanding of the complicatedness of uncertainty for different audiences can be a great start to having a conversation that is fruitful um, instead of um, more contentious. So, I will end my little um, talk here with kind of an analogy that has developed from some of my work on uncertainty communication around the COVID vaccine. Um, so in an experiment, we gave people certain versus uncertain information and then had them respond with some measurements of their understanding and trust and things like that. And kind of what our data ended up telling is kind of a story that I like to use a hiking analogy. We're in Colorado. We all like to hike, right? So if I am on a trail and here I am hiking and I see a sign and it's very certain, go this way, this will happen. Immediately, I like that. It's certain, it's decisive, it seems clear, I understand it. But then when I get to the fork in the road, I was not prepared for these different possibilities. And now maybe I don't trust that sign anymore or I'm confused or I'm not ready. 
Versus if I'm hiking and I see a sign that says, well, this way versus that way. And, oh, you might have the trail washed out there if the weather's been bad. Well, that's uncertain. Maybe it's harder to understand. It's complex. It's hard. But when I get to that fork in the road or the trail washed out, I'm prepared for those possibilities. And so we've spent a lot of time talking about, oh, uncertainty is complicated and hard. But we have to communicate it. We can't just pretend the uncertainty doesn't exist because it doesn't prepare people for those outcomes that could happen. And so with that double-edged sword, remembering it's really complicated. We need to have empathy for people. This is hard, but we need to communicate this so that we are being transparent and they're prepared for diverse outcomes. Um, how do we walk that tightrope is kind of some things that we will talk through throughout today. So I'm going to stop my share and Kristen is going to um, do kind of some panel discussions with us. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, that was a great sage setting talk. Uh, really appreciate that. That's building on a little bit of what we heard yesterday and, and taking it really focused here on actual talking about science. Um, I want to turn to both Max here and then Chris. Um, Max, what additional thoughts and framing do you think about when you want to communicate scientific uncertainty? Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Nicole, that was a wonderful setup, too. I really appreciate that. And my mind just casts to you had a set of choices, right? Of course, we can ignore uncertainty. But if we want to engage in it, I think my mind just goes to the fact that what do we do? Very logically, oftentimes, we try and provide more information in order to reduce uncertainty. Um, but we have to recognize that there are certain traps that are involved there too. And so when I'm listening and I'm thinking about, you know, where we might take this productively, when we're providing these uh, sets of information, you know, you mentioned that I was a contributing author to the IPCC um, assessment report, the recent one, the, the final working group, that yes, we put out all these reports. It is helpful, it is sufficient, but it's not it isn't sufficient. It is helpful, but it's not going to get us all the way there. There is this logic, though, that we can fall into that's called the information deficit model. And so there is this, um, this school of thought that says, yes, the inf info deficit model is problematic. And yes, it still continues in certain ways. Because there are those of us who within our communities find comfort in relying on our trained expertise to provide information so that people can quote unquote do the right thing or so that people quote unquote get it. Um, and that can be comfortable. You know, there is certain legitimacy and authority that's gained through our training. Uh, but we also have to have that humility that Nicole, you rightly pointed out is that we need to rely on one another for multiple pathways into um, meeting people where they are and having effective conversations. And so that can be through experiential ways of knowing that can be through emotional ways of knowing. It can be through aesthetic ways of knowing and on and on. And that's where partnerships come into play. So when you mention empathy and understanding, to, to have those effective conversations, we see the role of, of, uh, of the formal sciences in providing more information that can help address uncertainty to a certain extent. But we also have to live with that uncertainty as this entire uh, two-day set of events tells us is that we have to live with that and how do we live with it is by working collectively and with multiple perspectives. Thanks, Max. Chris, what sort of thoughts come to mind to you when you think about this topic? Yeah, you know, I mean, as a scientist who works to understand what the future of the environment holds and particularly the climate, um, I'm used to having to deal with uncertainty and I really liked the way that Nicole framed the the sort of qualitative and quantitative flavors of it. That was really um, a neat way to think of it. And you know, as a as a scientist in my field, it's treated very quantitatively. Um, we like to work really hard to put honest error bars on on things, and um, we tend to be conservative, meaning um, not take shortcuts or undersell the uncertainties as scientists. Um, but as a citizen and someone who believes it's important to engage with the stakeholders, you know, I see that the public rarely embraces that distinction. So I really think I think there's a lot to unpack with that with that diagram that Nicole showed. Um, you know, for example, if if uh, my field is trying to predict how hot it's going to get in in Central America by 2050 because it has um, 
impacts on on human health, chronic kidney disease, um, things like this. You know, what's going to be the impact if we do something um, really proactive about climate change to avoid those things, like um, you know, mitigate, uh, enact policy that mitigates our emissions, or something even more uh, aggressive, like injecting aerosols into the stratosphere. Um, to 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 block out some of the sunlight and cool the climate back down. I mean, the uncertainties on these are on these things are huge, and the sources of the uncertain there are multiple sources of uncertainty, and and it usually comes down to what you know the biggest un source of uncertainty is usually what we're going to do as a human society. So it's such a it's such a multi. I mean, just to say that it's a multidisciplinary problem is totally um, like the understatement of the century. It, it, it's not. It's not the science. It's not the climate scientists who can answer those questions. It's economists. It's um, people who are um, experts in tech, technological development and the energy transition, human behavior, geopolitics, um, and we're really we're really as scientists um, putting that information out there, but then it's always um, kind of hard to watch how uncertainty can be, you know, uh, misinterpreted at best and misused also as, um, you know, uh, sort of towards the, uh, referring to the end of Nicole's presentation, sort of like, how do we actually make decisions um, with uncertainty like this? And it can often, it's usually used as a basis for inaction, right? Uncertainty is rarely used as a basis for action. It's usually inaction. So those were the thoughts that came to mind right off the bat from Nicole's awesome presentation. That's great. You all are um, hitting on so many big themes I want to dig into with you. Um, but I want to start with one, and then we'll kind of go a little bit theoretical here, but maybe I'm going to kick it back to you, Chris, and then we'll kind of go around. But this idea of the interdisciplinariness of our complex social problems, right? And it isn't just scientific climate, scientific uncertainty through the lens that you bring, but again, the human behavior and the social and the economics, the policy, the geopolitics, all that great stuff. So talk to me because this relates to what Max was saying about the idea of partnerships. Uh, when we think about how are we communicating things better together and breaking down some of those silos and doing that in the most effective means. And so Chris, let me start back with you and we'll go around to all of you through the lens of where have you seen this done well? Where is there an example or two that you all have done where, you know, it's either been a really thoughtful partnership or some really strong interdisciplinary work? Um, you know, I think some of the work the IPCC does obviously does this as well. But um, let's go back and make some more real world examples of where this actually is being successful. And Chris, if you want to start, that'd be great. Well, I can kick that off, but I, I really shouldn't say much. I should because my um, the sort of gold standard of that interdisciplinary collaboration that does a nice job conveying uncertainty and communicating it is of course the IPCC and Max should talk more about that. Um, but more on a small scale level, it, one, one sort of um, example that I was involved in just this year that I think is, you know, kind of just a microcosm, um, but I think it, it, it was eye-opening in terms of how to approach outreach and um, uh, communicating uncertainties to um, important carriers of the message out in our society. And um, Kristen mentioned that I have some affiliations with the public health and medical um, academic uh, institutions in this area. And, it, and one of these really wildly popular programs that we've had um, actually brings medical doctors uh, to Boulder to learn about climate change um, for a week. And um, one of these interesting things that we did was instead of just showing them slides <laughs> like we usually do uh, with all of those scary graphs with um, trends going up and so on. We we decided, you know, those people, you got to know your audience. These people know, these people know those sorts of things. They, they just don't really have a handle of what it looks like under the hood to do that kind of science. And what we, what we scientists mean by uncertainty when it comes to projections of climate change and impacts of climate change. So we, we actually brought medical doctors um, up to a, 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 a nearby institution called the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR. We did something that seemed kind of crazy, and we were we were told it sounded crazy at first. But we we introduced them to some of the the folks on the bleeding edge of climate model development, 
um, and running the sorts of experiments that feed right into the graphs that you see in the IPCC report. We sat them down and we literally showed them how we run climate models. And this involves Fortran code, you know, if anybody's even heard of that anymore. Uh, we showed them the code and we let them touch it and log into a supercomputer and um, modify a couple of you know, parameters like how much carbon dioxide is there in the atmosphere and then literally run a climate model. And they're not going to go back to their hospitals. They're, they're from all over the U.S., but they're not going to go back to their hospitals and um, make a make a, a, a case to their uh, chief um, you know, whatever, uh, that we need to buy a multi-million dollar computer and start doing climate modeling. But they went home with a conviction, you know, that they they understood. They, they may not understand exactly how to really do climate modeling, but they they believe that we do. <laughs> they believe that this is a rigorous, um, a rigorous science that's got numbers behind it and, um, you know, really gives them a look under the hood, how it works. And then when they communicate, you know, I see doctors and people in public health as um, much more effective carriers of a mess of, of the scientific message than climate scientists. <laughs> um, they're they're right there on the on the ground floor with uh, with real people with concerns um, about ways that climate affects their their lives. And um, just sending them home with a conviction like that, um, they'll never forget. They may not, you know, really know how it works, but they they touched it and they really see that this is a real thing. And um, I think that will really sort of bolster their ability to, to communicate with, with populations that um, scientists don't have direct access to out there in the public. But I would, I would suggest uh, as well that Max could talk more about the IPCC because that's a great example of um, all of those disciplines coming together. Yeah, I'm happy to add there. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate your comments. Um, before I do, I, one thing just strikes me that if I could just add in is that it could be fairly obvious to lots of us, but it bears repeating is that when we're talking about challenges of uncertainty and living with uncertainty as it relates to climate change and other um, challenges, that these aren't single issues that fit neatly into uh, certain categories, that these are challenges that thread into all different dimensions of the ways in which we live and work and play and relax in society. And so that's where not only is interdisciplinarity and collaboration helpful, but it's warranted and it's absolutely needed. Um, so the IPCC, I was just invited into this most recent iteration of it, the sixth assessment report. I think in part it notes that they are um, engaging in much more interdisciplinary ways where they have invited in more social scientists like myself um, to contribute to the report. And so just while the summary for policymakers remains a uh, document that's a little bit bland, to be honest, and yet it is the one that's looked at the most. It's bland in part because it has to be agreed by all governments line by line. Uh, when you turn to the technical summary, if you have an appetite for that or the full report itself, you can find some really rich and helpful statements, I think. I mean, among them, I just point out that in the technical summary, something that I managed to contribute and write in there just on page 11 is talk, which is relevant for us here is, is that accurate transference of climate sciences have been undermined significantly by climate change counter movements in both legacy and new social media uh, through misinformation. And so this is some this is a statement that has been backed up by a tremendous amount of peer reviewed research and it can build upon the information that Chris is talking about the insights gained through natural physical science uh, pursuits and then can help illuminate where are things breaking down where is misinformation cropping up and so there's several passages throughout the technical summary and the full report several of them that I wrote into it with full backing from peer reviewed studies that that can then be helpful. And just as I as I think about this, too, I spent uh, a week the, the second week at the most recent UN climate negotiations as an observer to the ongoing uh, discussions and deliberations that over in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. And when we're seeing these, these uh, sometimes clear-eyed statements from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change then uh, flowing into these halls of negotiations, 
that we can see misinformation cropping up all the time. We can also see uncertainty, as, as Chris had said and Nicole had said as well, as a reason for inaction, much more prevalent than a reason for action. Uh, just to give you an example is that in the IPCC sixth assessment report, there is, there is repetitive language about the importance of phase out of fossil fuels, about the causes of 21st century climate change. Um, yet when we are in those negotiating halls, this gets mired in a lot of, um, a lot of discussion around, well, shall we use phase down? Let's talk about emissions and not fossil fuels. And there really is an, an avoidance of the causes, which are humans and which are uh, emissions from fossil fuels. And then we can talk also about consequences and around loss and damage, but it's this interplay where there, when we have these complex interactions, there can be uh, really good examples of engagement in the face of uncertainty, but there are also oftentimes ways in which we can see this communication breaking down in the face of uncertainty, in the face of uh, mis and disinformation. Nicole, do you want to add on to that? Yeah. Yeah, I'll bring in a public health example, but I think it connects to a lot of, it's really cool to see the parallels between the climate stuff and health decisions, like for example, vaccination that's on all of our minds um, with misinformation that Max brought up. So I'll back up to just a touch of public health um, theory 101. Um, we as humans make health decisions that can be characterized in something called the health belief model, which basically says that the there's multiple factors that affect whether I make a health decision. So say it's wearing a seatbelt. If I think that getting in a car accident without a seatbelt is dangerous, I'm more likely to wear a seatbelt. And so the perceived severity of that thing, illness, injury, whatever, affects my health decision. So that some of those factors include perceived susceptibility, perceived severity, perceived barriers of doing the health thing to avoid the disease or whatever it is. And we see all of those factors affect um, COVID vaccination. And there's uncertainty with all of those factors. And so um, do I think, what, what's the chance I am susceptible to COVID? What's the chance I get really sick from COVID if I do contract it? Barriers, what's the chance I get really bad um, side effects from my vaccine and have to miss a day of work and I have a job that I don't have paid sick leave. Um, so all of these factors, and I think um, we could jump to like, oh, you're not getting the COVID vaccine. You don't trust science. And it's that sometimes kind of judgment comes from the scientific community to people versus the more empathetic, like, okay, there's probably a reason one of those mentally factors in your head is influencing your decision to not get the vaccine. Is there misinformation like Max is saying? Is there the uncertainty, I'm not 100% sure the vaccine is effective, so I'm going to take inaction instead of action, like Chris is saying. Um, but I think to your original question, Kristen, it takes an interdisciplinary approach to um, assess that. So my um, research team, we've done lots of interviews and focus groups with all sorts of people with different vaccine opinions and kind of maps, like where on there. Um, that, that health belief model, different places that uncertainty and misinformation is affecting their vaccine decisions. And solving that takes different solutions depending on where a person is coming from. And so is it they just need more information about the vaccine potentially, but a lot of the times, like Max said, that deficit of information is not actually the issue. There's other issues involved. Is it the economic issue and we need to bring in more social supports? Is it a societal or communal um, they're afraid they might get judgment from their community for getting the vaccine because they have a, the, their friends and family and networks are not getting the vaccine. Um, so groups like Immunize Colorado have done a lot of really great work on engaging with, oh, they're, this particular community is not getting vaccine vaccines. Let's connect with someone in that community who does trust the vaccine and have them help communicate. Um, they're going to be more effective than a scientist marching in. Um, and so engaging with kind of figuring out where is someone's hesitation or concern what aspect of uncertainty is most affecting their decision and then engaging the right person to help them work on that is going to be much more effective than effective than just throwing more facts and figures at them um and so yeah i think all these things with misinformation and inaction and then really getting to what's what's the root of the problem um can really help us best engage to help people make health decisions that are going to be the best for them on the public health standpoint 
I want to come back to misinformation, but I want to stick with something here first, which is, again, this information deficit model. We know that people just don't need often more information, technically scientific information. And, and I think there's probably differences between public health and climate, not to mention many other fields. Right. And there's that great saying, you know, facts don't change mind. You know, people change other people's mm -hmm. minds. And so this idea of storytelling and trying to think about both negative and positive framings and stories as both two very different tools that can have very different results, um, particularly sometimes if you even pair the positive and the negative types of framings together or do you lean towards one? I'd be curious how you think about approaching that when you're talking about communicating uncertainty uh, through those different lenses that you all have. Um, and I, it's open, whoever wants to pop in here first and chime in with a thought. I'm happy to start. I, I think what Nicole was hinting at a bit is that part of being effective and ultimately communicating is by listening to begin with and understand where people are coming from and get a better sense of who it is you're speaking with, what communities, what audiences, and so on. And so once that step is, is taken, um, then the kind of negative and positive valence can be more effectively considered. I, I know there has been a fair bit of research in the social sciences that, that have shown that if you really want to get people's attention, some of that um, some of the language, say, like the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres just recently used saying, we're on a road to climate hell and we have our foot on the gas pedal, that can raise awareness. It can also freak a lot of people out and paralyze them to um, not engage and take action. And so that's where I think, Kristen, as you're mentioning, that's where the pairing can be really important, is that there has been research that's been done that shows if you give people opportunities, if you show them that they have um, agency, that they have a say, that they can do things, um, that that leads to greater engagement and action as well. So that's part of the positive thing here is that people talk about, you know, food choices um, being a way that you influence your environment on a daily basis, the ways in which we are moving about this world every minute of every hour of every day and so on relates to climate change. So these are opportunities for engagement and positive change. And so that's at least a start to say that um, once you start to better understand who you're talking with, um, what you actually seek to accomplish, raising awareness, engaging people that can help dictate the approach you take. Yeah, I would I would just say, you know, the a great example that comes to mind is is uh, Catherine Hayhoe and Max, I know you know her and um, probably talked a bit about her in your book, um, you know, but she's she's really a, seen as a master in in our field as um, connecting with people where they are and her her particular um, kind of space that she does that in is is faith and, um, you know, people of faith and communities of faith and um, it's just amazing when you, when you, um, you know, talk to people about values and find on an issue like climate change, which is obviously where I tend to go back to, but um, on an issue like climate change, when you find aspects where um, you know you're something like something like religion or faith um, overlaps on values, um, it it really gets the conversation going in a positive direction rather than confrontational and coming from a place of pure skepticism. And she's a bona fide climate scientist, uh, a trained climate scientist, but I think she's actually in a political science department. Um, but yeah, she's she's a great example. So I would I would um, recommend looking into uh, reading about her and her her work. Yeah. In response to what you asked about Kristen with like storytelling and negative and positive framing, um, and then that's your example, kind of the fear mongering. I think in public health communication and vaccine communication, there is a lot of fear mongering that comes from that mis and disinformation side that, oh, my, my child had this vaccine injury. And this was even happening pre COVID days, obviously, when the, the fear mongering about the MMR vaccine and autism, for example. And in the vaccine communication literature, there's a lot of work being done around by Karen Ernst and others around how we need to 
to tell the positive stories. Um, I've heard the phrase, I, I'm not sure from where I can't take credit for it, but how a vaccine without incident is the greatest story never told. They're going to put on the front tabloid someone saying my kid had a vaccine injury, but the millions of us who vaccinate our children according to the CDC schedule and they're totally fine and now are protected, no one talks about that as an amazing story, even though it really is an amazing story. Um, so I think how we can have positive stories and not just the shock, fear mongering type stories um, can be really helpful. And I think as scientists, we're like, oh, that's an anecdote. That's not like data with a big end value. So I want to bring some JAMA article that has an N of a million. But honestly, data doesn't compete with emotion. Like if people have emotion, fear or whatever other emotion, if I come at them with data, that's a mismatch. If they have an emotion or a story, I need to meet them with an emotion and a story. And obviously my story should match the evidence-based peer reviewed literature, but there are stories that obviously fit that peer reviewed narrative. And so we need to get much better at telling those stories because those really connect with people. Storytelling is really powerful. Um, so let's, let's tell those greatest stories never told of, about ways that vaccines, for example, were useful and not scary. That's great, Nicole I, I, and everyone, on this panel knows this and hopefully those turning in today, we had a number of journalists and media communicators yesterday too, right? Andy Revkin, uh, Aperva from the New York Times, uh, Caitlin Kim from CPR. And what you all are speaking to and what you all are doing in this panel, which is how can scientists and other non-scientists as well think about that connection on that emotional level to tell that story? You know, and there was some pretty harsh criticism of the media landscape yesterday, obviously, and that's a whole big old talk to go down about the challenges of how people consume media nowadays, whether that's social and new media or legacy media, and some of those tendencies because it feeds into these core things that we as humans just like resonate with us, these emotions, and it kind of trickles that part of our brain. And, and that's why these things get attention. And so how do we think about, you know, as, as scientists and science communicators that many of us are, like, how do we think about those things that just happen in whether it's the business model or whether this happens naturally because of who we are as human psychology. Um, and so I'm glad you, you brought that up. We are going to have, we got about 15 more minutes here. Uh, so just kind of want to map out, give everyone a time check. Uh, I want to do a quick question because I thought this is a curious one um, that Kate asked here in the chat if someone wants to take it. And then what I want to do is move into maybe just some of these like truly tools and tips that you all want to give our audience. Give them this like, these are the things that we think works. And this will cue us up for some of our breakouts here in a minute. And then we'll have a little conversation about some of those tools and tips. Uh, but real quickly, uh, Kate had asked, you know, the idea of uncertainty driving misinformation or does misinformation allow for increased uncertainty? I'm guessing there's a little kind of a both and here to this sort of statement. I'm curious if anyone had a thought or reflection they wanted to share on that. Oh, Max, I, go ahead. Please go ahead, Nicole, okay. and then I'll follow. Okay, um, I think there's a little bit of both. So I mentioned in my kind of early talk that there's an element of kind of cognitively we try to fit the pieces together. And so we might, we humanity people um, might fill in some of that uncertainty to try to make a certain story. And that information that we fill in is not accurate or is an over interpretation of some preliminary data. Um, and so that kind of enables the development of misinformation. So uncertainty driving misinformation. But I think the other way can happen as well, where we talked about all these different types of uncertainty is kind of how we started the conversation. Um, and people can hit, really latch on to a particular like, oh, we have that measurement error or whatever. And that means the data is not valuable or valid. And so in that way, the misinformation kind of amplifies the uncertainty and acts like it's a problem, even though as scientists would be like, we, that's actually not a problem to us. There should be a an error bar on that data. So I think misinformation can amplify uncertainty and make it be seem it, like make make people think that that data is untrustworthy because it is uncertain. So I think it can go both directions, at least in what I've seen. I agree, and I was thinking about it across the different types that you presented before, Nicole. Um, is that I, really a distinction that I make when I, uh, and I, I don't know if this was in the question itself, but misinformation can just be 
by accident, um, just logically misunderstanding or misinterpreting something, whereas disinformation is more of the deliberate uh, insertion of bad information into the public sphere or into um, different places. And so with misinformation, I think Nicole's exactly right. I agree. It's And Kristen, the both and is my answer, is that when we break down the different types, um, we can have mis information that that pervades one's assessment of risk and it can it can be a function of our own risk perceptions that some of us may um be, may have quite heightened anxiety very quickly when it comes to certain risks more than than other people there is also when system parameters are known but the odds or probability distributions aren't aren't uh well established that that can lead to uh missing misinformation as well and then there's just unknown unknowns and there's indeterminate types of factors in our lives that that can feed off one another in in those ways so building upon the uh types of uncertainty that nicole had presented earlier i think that they can feed off one another and you know at times that um certain dimensions can quell one another as well right I think having that humility and the empathy that you all have been talking about is just goes so much so, so far here. Um, let's move into some actual tools and tips. And Nicole, I know you have maybe some slides that will help guide our kind of conversation here that we can kind of toss up here as we talk through. Uh, Nicole, maybe set us up with a few of these kind of tools that you use and truly in the public health lens. And then Max and Chris, um, we have a slide too that shows some top tips for community about climate change. You all can pick and talk about a few of those if you want, and then we'll just kind of have a little conversation. Um, so Nicole, do you wanna share those? And we're gonna add these up here. We'll keep you all on screen here, but Nicole, cue us up with a few of these tips for communicating public health. Awesome. One thing, um, and this comes from Paul Hahn, who's now at the NIH, and he, I've kind of talked about something with uncertainty communication. And they've done some really cool exper experiments around uncertainty normalization. And this, I think there's probably a role for this in climate. I would love to hear from Max and Chris their ideas on that. But I think this is particularly relevant with my work. I do a lot around emerging infectious diseases, so Zika and COVID and what's now, things like that. We're in those kind of crisis situations where there is inherently a lot of uncertainty that and all of a sudden the scientific method is in front of people's faces and they're seeing the evolving nature and if they're not used to that that can be like oh can we even trust these science people if we help people understand that hey science always has this inherent uncertainty we're not shocked we're actually expecting this we're following the data it's okay it's not it's not COVID is crazy it's just science has this that can actually help mitigate some of the effects so just kind of talking about the scientific method is one way that some of the data is shown to help mitigate some of the negative effects. Um, one other tool I really like to use, um, there's kind of a growing movement um, around inclusive science communication, which is really in contrast to that kind of information deficit that Max was talking about. Like, instead of just, I'm smart, you lack things, I'm going to dump data at you. Instead, recognizing like, hey, there, we need to have that empathy and humility. We need to consider people's identities and backgrounds and recognize that interdisciplinarity, reciprocity, we all have something to add. Um, we need to be flexible and reflexive and adjust. And so there's a lot of kind of tenets of inclusive science communication. I think that applies to kind of all of these topics and helps people with uncertainty. And then my kind of final slide here, this is from um, an article, uh, the text is a little hard to see for the reference, sorry. Um, with kind of when we are looking at public health emergencies and crisis, and um, this article was really examining like masking guidelines early in the pandemic when there was resource scarcity with the masks. What are some kind of guidelines for communicating? There's an uncertain situation. We aren't sure exactly what's going on. Trust is gonna be really important, these trusted messengers, and that might not be us. That might be like stepping aside and letting someone in those communities really talk. Someone like Catherine Hayhoe, who's built trust in the faith community because that is her community, something like that. Helping people understand the uncertainty like we've been talking about. Um, and then remembering values and emotions that like data is not 100% um, how people make decisions. Even us as scientists are humans and we have values and emotions that um, affect how we make personal or policy decisions in light of that data. So I think recognizing that is really important and not jumping to judgment of people if they don't make the decision that we would want. 
Um, and I'll throw up this article from the Uncertainty Handbook by Steve Lewandowski and others for climate change, but I will let Chris and Max jump in here um, if there's anything they wanted to highlight for climate change communication tips. I'm happy to further emphasize point number eight, which was raised earlier. And that's where um, I invest a fair bit of my um, experimental research efforts nowadays is to help um, build stories that can be resonant with different audiences. And so we have a project going here called Inside the Greenhouse, where a theater professor, Beth Osnes, an ecology professor, Rebecca Safran, a communication professor, Phaedra Pizzullo, and, and me um, together work with students and experiment in a variety of ways with other collaborators. So for instance, we're experimenting with the ways in which comedy can create stories and drive towards solutions and open people up rather than um, close them down and, and raise their defenses. We also are experimenting with advertising in uh, out of home places, buses and billboards to see if we can also um, create through imagery and through stories, these opportunities to engage with people more effectively. Yeah, and, and for me, you know, two, as a um, kind of physical sci climate scientist, one and two, or sorry, two and three on there really kind of resonate. I mean, two, I guess, naturally is going to make me a little uncomfortable, um, sort of sounding like you're sweeping what you don't know under the rug. But, um, you know, when you're talking about what you know, um, I think it's really important and effective when when you tell them how we know it. And if you really, if you know enough about the science, um, you know, for example, people are are always pretty surprised when I tell them um, that we can take a little sample of air that has some CO2 in it and run it through a gizmo in a lab called a mass spectrometer. And we can tell you whether it came from fossil fuel burning or not. Um, not a lot, of, that's, that's not one of those um, talking points that's used out there in the public too much, but um, I, I think, you know, it goes back to this authenticity thing. If you, if people can probably tell if you know the science or if you're just, you know, memorize talking points about climate change. And when I'm talking to, you know, people trying to give me a hard time, uh, you know, uh, whether it's the retired engineer, uh, uncle at Thanksgiving or, uh, you know, whoever it may be who wants to go toe to toe, uh, over the science, you know, I, I'm not a salesman of science, um, or frankly, even a, uh, you know, at least professionally, not a, not an advocate of a particular policy, but there, you know, every time I'm in the same room or unfortunately zoom room as a, somebody from the public health community, like you, Nicole, it's always like, I, I'm less and less surprised that we're talking because there are so many parallels. Um, and, and COVID just made that super obvious to a lot of people in my field. Um, talking about bending a curve, right? Uh, and you know, you can you you can talk about ab, you know, virtually absolutely precise numbers, like how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere today. And actually, I see a question by someone named Tom Heister, and I'm sort of speaking to that here um, in the comments. You know, you you can we can measure exactly how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. Uh, right now, we're doing it every day, uh, actually every minute on the top of Mauna Loa. And, you know, it's around 417, 418 kind of fluctuates from day to day. But that's where we're at. And it was, uh, you know, it was in the 200s in the in the early 1800s. So, you know, these are these are these are massive um, sort of first order changes. And that change is, um, you know, it. it Max was referring to going to um, Egypt for the Conference of Parties, which happens like every year. And um, despite all of those all of those international um, get togethers and uh, commitments and so on, that carbon dioxide curve has not flinched. When you're talking about the actual amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's going up in an exponential way, much like a pandemic. It hasn't flinched, no matter how, no matter even with the Paris Climate Agreement, it hasn't flinched. But what does flinch, which I think gives people hope, if I'm communicating with people and I feel like I've depressed them too much, um, 
if I want to give a little bit of hope, you, you can give the very unfortunate example that our emissions of carbon dioxide did drop uh, during the pandemic. I think it was about 5% um, the, the emissions. Now, that is not concentration. That's not the actual amount. It's just how much we've put in. It went down by our deposit. Our annual deposit was 5% less than it normally is. Um, and then if you look back in time at the various uh, at how much carbon dioxide we emit, the last time there was a, a drop like that was the global financial crisis in the uh, in the early 2000s. So it's never it's never like because of a good thing um, that our emissions go down. So it's uh, it sounds very like obviously that was nobody's idea of how to reduce carbon emissions, but it does show that we have our hand on the dial. And if we if large scale changes happen, whether for uh, terribly unfortunate reasons or for positive deliberate reasons um, we can actually enact change and then you can look at the montreal protocol and say yeah we fixed the problem uh we, we fixed the problem with the ozone hole you know it can happen that's a great uh, example chris um i want to leave you all because you all have kind of briefly touched on this and obviously we are the institute for science and policy um we've talked about policy we've talked about uh, how scientific uncertainty can be used to justify actions uh, or inaction, how it can be used, how it can be weaponized uh, potentially as well too. And climate change, public health, these are very political topics. They just are. You know, there isn't, there's no answer, single answer. There's no silver bullet, as Max would say. There's no, you know, there's no one way to do it. So leave us all with our audience of thinking about that kind of policy hat, whether that's a policymaker or someone that's a decision maker. You know, what is, is there a, a good lesson, a good tool, a good tip, a good experience um, that you've seen when it is about trying to make um, the science and the evidence and this uncertainty much more salient, much more resonant, much more useful to those who need to make decisions? Again, open floor. Who wants to start? Max? I got a smile. So you, body language makes me call on you. Max, go. Okay. Sure. Well, um... To help out a policy decision maker taking action, uh, I think offering support, um, offering encouragement, offering resources that can help them, um, because there's a variety of reasons why they may be hesitant. It may be political capital, maybe understanding and uncertainty, um, <clears throat> and it could just be you know time pressures too. And so engaging in conversation at all levels, whether it's a local um, political leader, elected official on your city council, or if it's a state representative or somebody at the federal government, um, we as citizens are constituents. And so we therefore have um, the right, and in some cases, the responsibility, you might say, of, of engaging and offering our support. And so once I think you lead with that and lead with inquiry and partnership, rather than attacks, I think more um, more positive outcomes for climate, for the environment, for public health can follow. I like, Max, that partnership you talked to. Um, there's a lot of literature um, kind of more in the science like education space, working with undergrads from diverse backgrounds, but I think it's really applicable here about this concept of being a boundary spanner, where you kind of are a member of multiple communities. And I think we as scientists need to grow in doing that. I think too often, like I'm a scientist and then there's those non-scientists out there versus remembering, like Max said, I'm also a member of this community and this constituency. And I'm a fellow parent of the other kids that go to the same preschool that my kid goes to, and I'm part of this other group and whatever. And I might have a lot of influence on those other parents at my kid's school just because I'm a parent and I can have a conversation with them. And yes, I have my scientific knowledge and I can bring that evidence there, but I don't need to like heavy hand to come in as the scientist with all the expertise. But I think too often we kind of forget that and forget that we're part of ourselves, the public, that term that I really hate because it's not useful, but we are part of the public. We are part of this, this community that we, that we live in and how can we engage in those partnerships and span those boundaries and, um, some actually some recent uh, work that uh, my group has been doing has found that when scientists have this kind of deficit view of the public, like I don't think that they actually understand science or they're very smart, those scientists are less likely to engage in conversations to address misinformation. Um, and so we kind of pull ourselves out. We're like, yeah, they're not even going to listen to me. I give up before I even start the conversation. 
But if I have a view that, hey, I think they're an intelligent human that needs a conversation to be had with them, the data is showing that I'm more likely to engage in that conversation. So I think having some respect for people and being willing to engage in those tough conversations and those partnerships, whether that's a policymaker or just another voter um, who's and kind of talking with them about what policies to support, um, that kind of posture of partnership, like Max mentioned, and it, um, connection across differences is really important. And I think hard to do in something like even personally, I have to grow in, um, but I think it's really critical. Well, it's hard to add much to that, um, but you know, and I maybe I'll say something controversial here just to end, <laughs> end the session. But I think it's not a bad idea actually to, in some cases, involve the policy sphere in the process of doing of you know shaping the science instead of waiting until it's all over, um, and we have results that are useless or or not you know not not useful in the the way that um, answering the questions that they need answered. And I, I'm not you know by policy it, it doesn't have to be at the grand level of you know big um senate floor debates or something like that but it could just be something like con conservation policy at a regional level um make as max said making yourself available but even even um, involving them in the shaping of the questions that you're going to address you know in science and then at the end of it you really have like they're already bought into it. They already have a, a stake in this and um, some sort of agency in the science. So I've found that useful in terms of some oceanography and climate change research at local levels for conservation of various um, species within ecosystems. But that's what I would add. Chris, I actually love that. I don't I don't find that controversial. I think that's useful, right? How do you make science really usable and relevant uh, to decision makers? And so I, I actually think there's a whole school of thought that supports that idea too. Um, you all, this was a wonderful conversation. What a pleasure. Um, not only have I gotten to know some of you a little bit better, Nicole and others, it's always great to see you. Thank you for your brilliant words.